I'm Susan Kay. I'm a numerical modeler at Plymouth Marine Laboratory. I'm going to give you a very simple introduction to marine ecosystem modeling. Now, a model is a very simplified version of reality. We put in the things we're interested in, we leave out other elements. So think about a model car, for example. It's got wheels, it's got a roof, so it's quite useful for telling you what a car looks like. It's no use at all if you're interested in what an internal combustion engine does or how it works. So you've got to build the model that tells you about the system you want. So, for example, here's the very simplest model you might construct for a marine ecosystem. We've got two kinds of phytoplankton. Sorry, two kinds of plankton. The phytoplankton picking up energy from the sun using it for photosynthesis and then zooplankton eating them. Phytoplankton will allow nutrients to grow. When the two kinds of plankton die, they might become detritus in the water. Some of that will be dissolved, become further nutrients, and you've got a cycle building up. So we could ask that model for some very simple what-if questions. Suppose, for example, this extra nutrients goes into the water for some reason. Now that's going to feed the phytoplankton. They'll start to grow. There's more for the zooplankton to eat, so their numbers will grow up. Go up. The detritus then, as these plankton die, there's more detritus around, maybe there's more nutrient. On the other hand, the phytoplankton are being eaten more, there's more predation by the zooplankton. So what's going to happen? What's going to be the result? It gets hard to understand. And that's where numerical modelling can come in. In numerical modelling, we take each of these equations, sorry, each of these arrows, and replace them with an equation. And that equation sums up everything we know about that process, in this case, zooplankton eating phytoplankton, everything we know from lab and field studies, one equation. Each equation, then, for the arrow, we can use a computer to solve the equations, to do the number crunching, and that'll tell us what happens as that time goes on from that extra nutrient, how will the phytoplankton population change, how will the zooplankton population change, and so on. This is a very simple model. There's only a simple number of questions we can ask it. At PML, we found it's easier to extend our model a bit. We can do more things with it. So moving forward from our very simple NPZD model, we've put in some extra phytoplankton. We've got four types here, which represent the vast number of different species of phytoplankton. And they just represent four different ways of life of phytoplankton, if you like. So for example, we've got diatoms. They build silic silicon skeletons. So we've got silicon in the model to represent that process. We've got three kinds of zooplankton, three different lifestyles of zooplankton we represent here. We've put in bacteria into the model because they do things that neither the phytoplankton nor the zooplankton do. And rather than just one kind of nutrient cycling around, this model enables us to calculate how much carbon, silicon, nitrate and phosphate there is in the model at any one time in different parts of the ecosystem. So we can begin to ask much more complicated questions. We've also got a model of the seafloor. Our benthic model will allow us to look at exchange at the seafloor. And exchange of the atmosphere is possible too. So there's much more scope here for asking questions about what's going on in the marine ecosystem. But we've still got limited things going on in this model at the moment. So far we've got all the biology, the chemistry that we can include, but we've got no physics. And that matters because it's the physical processes that change the temperature of the water and that move things around, that move the bacteria, for example, through the water currents. So we take our pelagic model here, our model of what's happening in the water column, and we can stack those up. We've got a whole stack of simple models, put one on top of the other, and we can track how things move up and down the water column. And down the bottom, we've got the benthic model. And those 1D models are quite helpful. They allow us to include a lot of the differences between the top and bottom of the surface without having to use an enormous computer power. This, these 1D models can run reasonably on a desktop computer. But to really get the full dynamics of the ocean, to allow things to move sideways as well, we need 3D models. And that's where the complexity of the model starts to build up, so things can move in all three directions. As well as adding the physics within the sea, we also add what's coming in from the outside. So we've got rivers adding nutrients and fresh water. We've got what's happening up here in the atmosphere, the weather that's going on. We can force our model with those externals, and that'll allow us to ask questions about climate change, for example, or about carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. How will those change the system? So we can take our biogeochemical model here of the ocean ecosystem, we can put it into one of the physics models, and we can apply that on a variety of scales, from here at a river estuary, to the shelf seas around the whole UK, shelf seas in the global scope, and also in the whole oceans around the world, the deep ocean as well as the shallow shelf seas. And here's an example of the kind of output we might get from our model. These animations were put together by my colleague Yuri Artioli, who was working on a project on ocean acidification. This one shows the present day, and this one a future. If we look first at the present, we can see that the pH here of the ocean is changing as time goes on. This is clicking away at one day per picture, so we can see the animation here of the seasons changing, 
The red is the higher pH, the more alkaline ocean. The blue is the more acidic ocean. And that's the present day. We can see there were seasonal changes and so on. We can see the same in the future. So 100 years later, in 2080, we still got seasonal changes. We've got the same scale here. And yet everything's looking a lot bluer. The ocean is much more acidic. So that would tell us something about what the future might hold. It's something that's going to be a useful tool for people making decisions about the seas in the future. We can't ask that question, really, as to what, whether that's the true situation 100 years' time until we get to 2080. But we can ask our model, do you really show us what the world is like today? So a really important part of our work is to validate our model against present-day data. So we use data from buoys, from ships, from satellites, and we match them up against our model outputs. We're using quite a variety of sophisticated statistical tools to do that, and that's a really crucial part of our work and something we really rely on the scientists who gather this kind of data. We also want to work to develop our models, so we're trying to produce better models than we've got already, again working with lab and field scientists who can tell us about the kinds of things these organisms do. One example, we were getting inside the cells of the phytoplankton. What's going on there? An example might be how they respond to high light levels. They put more resources into protecting themselves against the high light. In the dark levels, they put more resources into photosynthesis. And this is an area that many scientists are working on at PML, so it's a, a very good um, collaboration for us. We're also working to improve our model of the seafloor. At the moment, our seafloor model has three layers. Maybe that will be improved if we put extra layers in. We'll be able to then get the seafloor model bottom better. So to finish off with, here's a quick summary of what we do at PML with our models. We apply them into looking at climate change, looking at energy and carbon mitigation, and also for looking at short-term forecasting of marine ecosystems. Also, a big part of our work at PML is to improve our models, building on those very simple foundations that we started with, how can we go on and develop and make our models better and better to do these jobs even better in the future?